Hi, welcome to Introducing the Bible. In the Shakespearean play, As You Like It, Jacques says to his companions, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Well, the Bible portrays God as the focal character of this great play we call life. He commands centre stage. The Bible is the story of his great plan to save humanity. When we get to the New Testament, we reach the climax of the drama, the showdown between good and evil only one will win. To do battle against evil, God doesn't send another prophet, teacher or king. He sends his son. His son came primarily not to teach people how to live, nor to heal the sick, nor to be anti-authority, but to bring new life to the spiritually dead. In the opening pages of the Gospel according to Matthew, we read, His name is Jesus, which means God saves. He shall save God's people from their sin. Matthew also tells us, He shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. All God's power, God's wisdom and God's love are found in him. Let's hear the story of his birth. About 2,000 years ago, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that everyone in the Roman world should be enrolled. So everyone went to register in their hometowns. Joseph was a descendant of King David. So he travelled from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of David. He went there to register with his future wife, Mary. Mary was expecting a baby, and while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for the child to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a feeding trough, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in the fields, guarding their flocks through the night watch. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the splendour of the Lord blazed around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This very day in David's town, a Saviour has been born for you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is what will prove it to you. You will find a newborn baby lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly, a great company of heaven's army appeared with the angel, singing God's praises. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to people on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, well, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing which happened which the Lord's told us about. So they came as fast as they could and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. The baby was lying in a feeding trough. When they had seen him, they told everyone what the angel had said about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds returned to the fields, glorifying and praising God for everything they'd heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. The New Testament declares that Jesus is God's Son. But why did God send his Son into the world? If you ask the question why Jesus came into this world, a number of people might give different answers to it. I think the one, the one to whom you'd have to turn is to Jesus himself because he speaks about this, that he came into this world deliberately because the world needed him.
in the sense that he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. A profound dislocation between ourselves and God, the breach between ourselves and God was the, was the matter that he came to deal with and to overcome. He came to reconcile the lives of men and women to the, to the God who made them, to retrieve a lost world. He speaks of himself as a shepherd who goes after lost sheep, as a physician who goes out to heal people. And that whole sense of purpose, that focus on coming to retrieve the lives of men and women and to bring them back into fellowship with God, that carries him all the way through critical opposition and in some cases adulation, but in the end through betrayal and takes him all the way to the cross of Calvary, which is still part of the purpose itself. In a sense, he for this hour, he says, he'd come into the world. He came finally to die for the lives of men and women, that through the very dying of Jesus and the rising from the dead, he might bring about the reconciliation, which was the very focus of his life. I think that's how, that's how he put it in his own words. In the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Christians in Corinth, he writes regarding Jesus. He says, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. God promised in the Old Testament to save his people from the consequences of their selfish ways. The New Testament declares that Jesus is that saviour. The Jesus video reenacts a story from the Gospel of Luke where an old man, Simeon, announces the baby, Jesus, is God's promised saviour. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. eyes have seen thy salvation. This child is chosen by God. May you both be blessed. A very big idea in the minds of people at the time of Jesus was the notion of the kingdom of God. There would come an age when not just this king or that king or this Roman emperor or that Roman governor would rule, but ultimately God's rule itself would take possession of this world. It would be God's kingdom, and he would rule through his chosen prince, as it were. And people in the days of Jesus, particularly the Jewish people, were waiting for and looking for the coming of the kingdom. And right from the start of the ministry of Jesus, he speaks about the kingdom of God, and he says the kingdom of God has drawn near. The very thing for which they're waiting has drawn near and in his own ministry he demonstrates through the miracles that he performs and through the words that he speaks that he in fact is bringing the kingdom of God into the lives of men and women. So you cannot in the end understand the ministry of Jesus unless you understand it as being the point at which and through which the kingdom of God, the rule of the, of the God of all creation comes into the lives of men and women through Jesus. From the story of Adam and Eve in the early chapters of Genesis, we saw the framework of the kingdom of God broken. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's rule. God kicked them out of his place, and they were no longer his people. But God promised to restore the kingdom of God. He does this through his son, Jesus. Jesus came to call people to believe in God. In other words, to become God's people, to be obedient to God's rule, and very soon they will enter God's place. Most people today call it heaven. As you read the Gospel stories, a major question arises. Who is Jesus? In the Jesus video, a portrayal of Jesus' life from the Gospel of Luke, the disciples are asked this question. Who do the crowd say I am? Some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah. While others say that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. What about you? Who do you say I am? You are God's Messiah. You shall tell no man of this. The Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. He will be put to death, but three days later will be raised to life. 
why does Jesus hide his identity? Partly it is because uh, at that time there was a kind of ferment amongst the people, a very volatile situation. Israel was occupied by a foreign invader and people were looking for a Messiah who was really going to flex his muscles. There was a kind of a redneck Messiah. People were looking for that kind of person. And Jesus wanted to make it very clear that he was not that kind of Messiah. He, he, was, he was not a bloodletter. He was not a victorious figure in that sense. He came as a servant. And not just for Jews, but for all people. And so that Jesus was not just advocating the particular cause of Israel, but he came to serve Jews, but also all people of every tribe within the world. Given the fact that Jesus was reluctant to allow the word Christ to be used of him during his earthly ministry, reluctant for a fairly obvious reason in the end, because it suggested kingship, it suggested monarchy, it immediately, as it were, fueled all the imaginations of men and women with the thought that any moment there'll be a bust up with the power of Rome, and there'll be a military showdown, and all those kind of sort of cataclysmic events that will mark out the finale. That sort of thing. Jesus says, no, 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 that word. He chooses another word to speak of himself. He allows the word Christ to be used of him because it is true. But it's not a word for publicity. The word that he uses publicly is son of man. The son of man. The foxes have their lairs, the birds of the air have their nest, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And you keep coming across this expression, son of man, son of man, the son of man, the son of man. And it's a word which seems, in a sense, to be elastic. It could just be little different from saying I, you know. Foxes have their places to sleep, the birds have their nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But the word Son of Man itself is an Old Testament expression. It's not just meaningless. It already has its own meaning. It can, of course, just refer to humanity. What is man that you are mindful of him, says the psalmist, or the son of man that you care for him, which is just another way of talking about mankind. Jesus could be presenting himself as a man amongst men and emphasizing that. But it has even more than that. The great prophet Ezekiel is always referred to as son of man. When God speaks to Ezekiel, oh, son of man speaks to him that way. But there is a very special part of the Old Testament where the word son of man is used. And it's clearly Jesus has this in mind. And that part is in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And when Daniel has his vision of the close of the ages and the fulfillment and triumph of the purposes of God, he speaks of one like unto the Son of Man. And to him dominion and power is given by the Ancient of Days. This figure of great and final grandeur that will, will as it were, fill the horizon of history and gather up the whole cosmos of God. This is the figure of the Son of Man. Now that is a very splendid and exalted figure. And when Jesus uses the word, there is this movement in the word, this elasticity in the word. Sometimes it, were, it seems to mean minimally. Then at other times it stretches up to the top end. We know that it stretches up to the top end because he uses that very quotation from Daniel, from Daniel chapter 7. When Caiaphas finally confronts him and says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, I am and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And straightway, as it were, it locks that expectation in to the figure of Jesus. He is, as it were, he will fulfill the destiny of the Son of Man for the nations of the world. And to him, all power will be given. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. During this vision in the night, I saw one who looked like a son of man. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds. And he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power. 
so that the people of all nations, races and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. Uh, Son of man is a term that turns up from the book of Daniel and it probably goes back to the early chapters of Genesis and God's creation of man. Um, very probably son of man is a term which means a human figure. And the book of Daniel looks into the future and sees that, that uh, there is going to be a great human figure who will stand at the side of God and this human figure will be given a kingdom and a rule over all people and that all people will worship him and all people will acknowledge his rule. Astonishingly, Jesus says he is that figure. He is that son of man that the Bible said would come and to whom God would give the rule over all things and the worship of all things and all people. In the Gospels Matthew, Mark and Luke, we find a story where Jesus refers to himself as the son of man and by his actions claims to be God. One day when Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every town in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed and they tried to take him into the house and put him in front of Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they could find no way to take him in. So they carried him up on the roof, made an opening in the tiles, and lowered him down on his bed into the middle of the group in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw how much faith they had, he said to the man, Your sins are forgiven, my friend. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees began to say to themselves, Who is this man who speaks such blasphemy? God is the only one who can forgive sins. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, why do you think such things? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. At once the man got up in front of them all, took the bed he had been lying on, and went home praising God. They were all completely amazed. Full of fear, they praised God, saying, What marvellous things we have seen today. From the opening pages of Genesis, God has promised to deal with human sin. In the reading, the reaction of the religious teachers is correct. Only God can forgive sins. The problem is their response. They won't accept that Jesus is God. Jesus says to the religious teachers, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, which is easy to say but impossible to prove, or get up, take your mat and walk, which is easy to say but impossible to do. He then shows them that he has the power to forgive sins by healing the paralyzed man. In the miracle, Jesus exhibits God's healing power and his forgiveness, both attributes of God. It's true to say that during the life of Jesus, when you read the Gospels, he refers to himself consistently as the Son of Man. He does refer to himself also as the Christ of Israel. And the expression Son of God is used of him. And it seems quite clear in his own words that he used the word Son. He thought of himself as the Son of his Heavenly Father. That expression was very intimate and very close and very personal to him. And so when the New Testament writers speak of him as the Son of God, they do so in a way that is quite consistent with the way Jesus also can speak of himself. But the word Son of God itself is uh, again a little bit elastic as an expression because it can be used as a synonym, as it were, having about the same value meaning as the word Christ. Thus, for instance, when Caiaphas says to him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He's not saying, are you the Christ, and what is more, as it were, something even further than that, 
Now, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Or when Peter says at uh, Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus says to Peter, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That expression like that. Now, Peter is only confessing at that stage that Jesus is the Christ, the fulfiller of the Old Testament, the one who gathers up all the promises and brings the kingdom of God to pass. But this word, Son of God, is, as it were, like a, like a, like a time bomb that's ticking. It has more in it, something else to disclose within it. There is something about the sonship of Jesus that is not just easily boxed in to ordinary humanity. And by the time the New Testament is finished speaking about Jesus, it is speaking about him as son of God in a sense that he brings, he brings the presence of God into the lives of men and women. He is so intimate in his relationship with God, his heavenly father. Such a unique bond is there that he deserves the title sonship in a way that is not just equivalent to Messiah. It's not just another title of honor. It tells us something highly distinctive about the figure of Jesus, that he is the one who embodies and expresses the presence of God the Father to the lives of men and women. And when they were in the presence of Jesus, they knew they were in the presence of God. The Gospel of Mark begins, the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Bible declares Jesus is more than just a great man. He is God. Christ uh, really reveals all that God had revealed himself to be within the Old Testament. God reveals himself to be holy and pure, and Jesus reveals himself to be holy and pure. Uh, God reveals himself to be against all injustice and exploitation, and Jesus reveals himself to be against all injustice and exploitation. Uh, God in the Old Testament reveals himself to be compassionate and merciful, and, and Jesus is the friend of sinners and compassionate and mercy, merciful. God reveals himself in the Old Testament as one who works great miracles and signs. Jesus reveals himself in his ministry as one who works great miracles and signs. So holiness, purity, justice, compassion, the working of miracle signs, all the things that God does, Jesus does. Well, if you were to make a comparison between Jesus and some other figure of history, who lived for about the same number of years. You might, for instance, choose a very conspicuous figure like Alexander the Great, and he lived to his early 30s, and Jesus similarly lived into his early 30s. Alexander was, what, some three and a half hundred years earlier, fourth century BC, and when he came onto the scene, he came onto the scene as a highly trained military expert and led his troops with a kind of charismatic leadership through a series of campaigns against the Persians and toppled the empire of Persia and took hold of Egypt and carried his troops down through Afghanistan and conquered forces as far down as the Ganges River in India. It's a meteoric career of sort of military spectacular success that uh, left its imprint on the imagination of generations that followed and also left behind it historically a world that he had dramatically changed. Now, if you put a figure like Jesus over against that, who in fact leads no uh, military contingent of troops in any direction whatsoever, and in fact when Pontius Pilate asks him whether or not he is a king of any kind, Jesus answers, well, yes, he is, but not a king of this worldly kind. His kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, he said, then his disciples would fight. So he disengages from that comparison with a person like Alexander. His kingship is not achieved by military aims. And yet over the space of the same number of years, and in fact concentrating his final efforts into some three years in a shorter span than Alexander's, you might say his impact on human history has been far, far, far greater than that of Alexander. He transformed men and women in the generation to which he belonged. And he has in fact continued to transform millions upon millions of people. So he didn't just establish a territorial boundaries or rewrite history at some critical point so that from then on things would flow differently. But he uh, created a movement within the lives of men and women that has, cease, that has never ceased to have a transforming impact upon generations right down to our own day. So here we are consciously linking ourselves to the figure of Jesus in a way in which no one would ever think of linking themselves to such a figure of, as Alexander the Great.
The person of Jesus stands among men unequaled and unsurpassed. He is unique. Napoleon once said, Everything in Christ astonishes me. His spirit overawes me, and his will confounds me. Between him and whoever else in the world, there is no comparison. Jesus didn't come to point an accusing finger to tell us how bad we are. He came to bring us back into a relationship with God. Jesus is prepared to call us friends. Friends when we've disobeyed him. Friends when we haven't wanted to know him. Friends when we've been living in rebellion. It's an amazing offer. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Next episode, we'll explain how this offer of eternal life is made possible as we continue to introduce the Bible.